Hello. All right. Welcome to the show. This is Beak Talk, episode number 13. Today we're talking about basic honey extraction uh, using the crush and strain method. This is a time-tested, old, classic way of doing honey extraction. Um, hopefully you all can hear me out there. Um, so thank you for turning into Beak Talk. This is the weekly live stream show that discusses the methods and approaches one might take when keeping bees. I am the host of the show, and my name is Eric. Today, we are talking about the sweet stuff. Uh, I'm going to be showing you the most basic and simple method for extracting honey using the crush and strain method. Uh, like I said, this is a classic way to get honey out of the comb. Um, however, I'm sure... You know, this is not the, the method that all beekeepers use. However, I'm sure a lot of beekeepers have used this method when they were starting out. Um, so since I like to focus this show on the basics for people, um, I am going to be discussing crush and strain. So as always, my goal for the show is to have interaction and to help you understand the world of honeybees. So as I discuss today's topic, please feel free to be in the comments and uh, make some contributions to the show. If you've ever done crush and strain uh, or have any stories about it, uh, I'd love to hear about them. If uh, you have any questions, definitely drop them in the comments as well. I can answer those as I go through the show. And uh, let's, you know, let's have a conversation. My favorite commenter at the end of the show will win one of these really cool Beak Talk stickers. If you're a fan of, show, of the show and want to support us, you can purchase any of these stickers as well as uh, check out some bees. I sell five frame nukes that are raised in the Poconos uh, of Pennsylvania. So you can check those out. I also offer queens later in the season. You can also see some blogs and suggested products, some products that I'll be discussing today. You can purchase through affiliate links on my website. Uh, the link to my website is in the comments below. It's blossombuzzbees.buzz. Um, so let's get started on today's topic. Um, like I said, today's topic is the simplest way to extract a very small amount of honey. Uh, this is the crush and strain method. This has been used for basically as long as there's been beekeepers, we've been doing this method. Of course, in the modern ages, we have a lot of tools that make this process a lot easier. Um, so we'll get right into it. What is crush and strain? It basically involves removing the, oh, I have some friends on. Hi, Carly. Uh, removing the honey from the honeycomb. You see my background here is beeswax honeycombs, and it's full of honey. And this is where the bees put the, the honey to store. Um, Another old school method of transporting honey for you know beekeepers and for people buying it is to actually keep it in the honeycomb. Uh, this was an old school way of knowing for sure that it was honey because honey is the only thing that, be, uh, that humans can't reproduce. Uh, only bees can make honey. And we also can't put anything in those combs and make it look the same way the bees do. Um, so back when you were doing, uh, making trades out of a wagon, that's how you knew you were getting real honey. Um, so crush and strain is a simple method. You're basically taking these honeycombs, breaking them up, and allowing the honey to separate from the comb or using a, a filter to separate. Um, so you got the crush and then you got the strain. And like that, it's really simple. Uh, I do want to advise you, it's all not glit, uh, you know, glitz and glamour. It is a very sticky process. It is difficult for the bees. It's you know, uh, time consuming for the beekeeper. So commercial beekeepers will use you know, larger extractors and much more efficient systems uh, to keep it less sticky and to make it easier for the bees and the beekeeper. Um, but if you are brand new, a first year, second, third year beekeeper, and you're only extracting a very small amount of honey each year, uh, if you don't want to invest in flow hives or a system like that, crush and strain is a really good way to get you to extract some honey without having to invest in really expensive extraction equipment. Um, 
Also, if you purchase any of the products that I suggest to you today, uh, that's all equipment that you're going to need in a uh, small scale or a medium scale extraction system anyway. Um, so I wouldn't say it's money wasted. It's just uh, you're sp spreading the investment over a few more years. Um, so let me just check over my notes here. Like I said, if you have any questions as I go along here, feel free to drop in the comments. Uh, I would love this to be an interactive show and to be educational. So I want to hear what your experiences are. Now, uh, I did say that not all beekeepers use this method because it is not that efficient and it is very sticky. Um, but a lot of people use this when they start out. I used this method for probably the first, you know, four, five, six years that I was a beekeeper. Uh, I wish that I watched a video like this before I tried my ways as a youngster, um, because it was definitely a lot more messy and a lot more sticky than it needed to be. Uh, what I'm going to show you and demonstrate to you today is, I think, one of the least sticky ways to go about this method. Um, but don't get me wrong, it's still a, a very sticky way to do it. All honey extraction is very sticky. Um, so yes. So what tools do you need to do a crush and strain? Basically, you need some containers, about three co big containers. Uh, you need a scraper and you need a filter. For the containers, I recommend using uh, five gallon buckets. You can buy them food grade. This one has some uh, paint on the outside. It's an old, old bucket, but it does the job. Uh, five gallon buckets are great. You can get those food safe in any big box stores. Um, you can also purchase on my website. I have a affiliate link to Amazon where you can get gate buckets. It's basically a five gallon bucket that has a little spigot on it. And this allows you to bottle honey directly from here, which makes bottling honey a breeze. Um, so you need buckets. I would recommend getting one gate bucket as your final bucket and then a primary bucket that has a lid. It doesn't need to have a gate. It could be a completely solid bucket. Um, but a nice big five gallon bucket is a good way to start. And you definitely need a lid for the way that I'm going to explain to do this process. Um, lastly, you'll need a, either a smaller bucket, a one or two gallon bucket, or a thick freezer bag. Um, you need a place to put the wax that we crush and strain out. Um, so some beekeepers will feed that wax back to the bees, and um, I'll talk more about that in a minute, actually. Um, as far as scrapers go, uh, you can use something metal like this. Uh, this is a, a dough cutter. You could use a like a barbecue spatula, something that has a, a nice wide blade that's pretty sturdy and is easy to wash. Uh, stainless steel, plastic, all great tools to use. Um, stay away so, from some like funky metal. So if you have a, 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 a mixed metal or an aluminum scraper, I would stay away from those things. Um, not any particular reason, uh, just personal preference. I like the nice, clean stainless steel or plastic. Uh, other things you want to keep in mind, everything that you're using needs to be food safe because honey extraction is a food process. Uh, the other things to keep in mind, everything needs to be clean and dry. Too much excess moisture on your equipment can add moisture to your honey and... Um, you only have about a one or 2% buffer zone uh, with the honey before you're too wet and it can ferment. Uh, so we don't want fermented honey because that it goes bad. Uh, so we definitely need to keep all of our equipment bone dry. Take the time to dry it. Uh, it's definitely worth your time. So now that we've talked about the equipment, like I said, you could use, oh, I should also mention, Strainers. You can use your metal colander that you use for spaghetti. You can use cheesecloth. I, I wouldn't waste your time with coffee filters. That's too fine. Um, you can use metal chinoise. You can use all kinds of things. Or you could purchase one of these filters from the bee supply or a paint supply store. Uh, it's basically a little reservoir 
that has a, a micron filter. And the best part is it fits right inside of your bucket. Um, so I do recommend these. They're only like five or six bucks. Um, you can buy heavy duty metal ones. I have a link on my website as well. Um, those are all good investments. And whether you're doing crush and strain as a permanent honey extraction method or as a temporary fill until you can invest in a good system, you're gonna need filters, you're gonna need gate buckets, you're gonna need scrapers anyway. Uh, so it's definitely worth the investment for your first couple of years. Um, so now let's talk about honey. Um, as I'm doing this introductory uh, beginners kind of conversation, I do wanna talk about what kind of honey is uh, the honey you're looking for. First things first, you wanna make sure you have honey and not syrup. So if you've been feeding your, your bees syrup all spring and you stopped feeding them syrup a week ago and now you want to go in and extract honey, you're going to have tainted or funny honey. You're going to have a mix between the syrup and the nectar that came from the environment. Um, so for a beekeeper, you don't really want to extract that. It's not what you're looking for. You're looking for honey from the plants. Uh, so for that, you need to give the bees a a thick buffer zone between when you were feeding syrup and when they were producing honey that you can extract. Um, so that's one thing that you can document on your regular inspections of how many frames of resources are there and the sources. If you realize that this is a frame of, you know, syrup from when you're feeding syrup, you want to remember not to extract that. Um, so definitely if you're open feeding, you can't be making honey at the same time. And if you're feeding the hive directly, you can't be making honey at that same time as well. You need feeding time and honey time to be separate. Um, so that's why beekeepers only feed during select periods or select hives under certain circumstances. So honey is what you're looking for. You're also looking for a frame that does not have brood on it and does not have pollen one or two cells of pollen isn't going to hurt but brood can be an issue if you have too much of it so if you find a frame that's mixed it has a little bit of everything you can't extract it uh, using this method or any method what you are looking for and i'm going to add a photo to the screen here excuse me this is what capped honey looks like um, you see there's a few cells that have let me, let me pull this up so you can see my cursor here a few cells that aren't capped, they don't have that white capping, that is all right. If you look, almost this entire frame is capped. There's a couple of cells that aren't, you know, it could be any, any number of reasons why it's not capped. But if you average this whole frame, you have capped honey. And that's what you're looking for. There's no pollen, there's no brood, there's none of that. Um, so that that is the frame you're looking for. Um, like I said, this method only is efficient for if you have a couple of frames. A new beekeeper who is gonna extract five or six frames uh, a year, this is a method that, that'll work for you. Um, otherwise, it's kind of wasteful for the bees. So we are talking about what is a good frame. Um, so here's my Here's my recommendation. Uh, the other thing that you want to keep in mind is when you're pulling frames that you want to extract, you want to make sure that there is enough food in the hive to keep the hive happy. Uh, so if we're going into a resource, resource dearth when there's not a lot of resources in, in the environment, you don't want to pull honey and not feed the bees afterwards if there's not resources around. So you want to make sure there's enough to keep the bees happy and to get them to the next honey flow um, and not take all of their honey. Beekeepers, you only want to take the excess. Bees do a great job of producing more than they need, and that offers us a little bit of room to take some. You don't want to take it all because then you could hurt your bees. Um, and that's against what we're trying to do as beekeepers. Here's my recommendation. If you only have one or two hives and you think that this is the method you want to use for extracting honey, 
I think you should make this a two week process, a two inspection process. Your first inspection, you go in to your strong hives and you analyze and, and, and count how many frames you can pull from this hive. If you have 10 deep frames and you go in and you see that there's only two frames that are solid honey and that are capped, um, I would remember and document where those frames are located in the hive and you know make sure there's enough resources to get the hive through and then close up the hive. Your next inspection, uh, maybe a week later, is when you can do the crush and strain. Um, but I would definitely document where those frames are and what hives have those frames. So when you go in for your inspect your uh, extraction day, you aren't kind of messing around and interfering with the bees unnecessarily. You want to be prepared, know where to go, what hives to go to, what frames to pull, so you can do the least messing with the bees. Um, happier for the bees, better for you because you're not going to get stung as much. Extraction day is a rough day for the bees and the beekeeper. Um, that's a, a forewarning. That's just the way it is. Um, so being prepared with good notes beforehand will definitely help you out. Uh, so if I don't have any questions, I'm going to move along to extraction day. We are ready. We have our tools together. We've washed everything. We've dried everything. Uh, keep in mind, beeswax is um, its not permanent, but I'm going to say it's certainly semi-permanent. So any tools that you use with beeswax, it is possible that they could spend the rest of their lives as beeswax tools. Um, definitely be careful using your good kitchen tools for rendering beeswax or scraping beeswax or cleaning up beeswax because um, once the wax gets hardened onto a tool, especially a plastic tool or in the mesh of your filter, not coming out, not coming out. Uh, so definitely be mindful to not use your partner's favorite uh, spaghetti strainer for beeswax. You might have to go to Home Goods and buy them a new one. Uh, keep those things in mind. Um, but we have all of our tools gathered, all of our buckets are bought and cleaned, and everything is bone dry. We're ready to do our extraction. You have your list of hives that have frames to pull. Uh, you have a bee brush and a smoker. You don't want to go crazy with the smoke because you can make the honey smell like smoke. Uh, but a little bit of smoke does help. Um, and definitely a bee brush does help as well. Now you're ready. What you're going to do is get your primary bucket. Um, if you have a five gallon bucket and a gate bucket for this process, you're going to use your regular solid five gallon bucket, no filter and a lid. That's the bucket you need. You also need a scraper to do this process. What you'll do is you're going to go into your apiary. You're going to find your frames that look really good like this. Um, since I am in an office space and I don't really want to do crush and strain for real right now, I'm just going to use this drawn comb as demonstration. But basically what you'll do, you have your bucket. Um, you're going to take your scraper and scrape all of that drawn comb and the honey into the bucket. Um, so if you're starting out with a plastic foundation, like a lot of new beekeepers are, right, plastic, you're basically going to take your scraper and run it right along this plastic and scrape everything off and let it fall into the bucket. Um, your scraper is going to get dirty. This is going to be covered in honey. But once you scrape all of this wax off and it's in the bucket and your frame is back to foundation and nice and sticky, you can put this frame right back in the hive. Um, so the process that we're doing, you're going to your hives. You have this set up on a little table or a little bench somewhere with the lid on. You go in, you remember where your frames that you're going to pull. You pull them out, you analyze them, make sure that there's no brood in it this time around. Take your brush, brush all the bees off, 
walk away from the hive. You could even put the lid loosely on the hive again to you know let them calm down. I would walk away from the hive, maybe 10 feet, just to give you, you and the bees a bit of distance. Um, and then you're gonna scrape the frame into the bucket. A five gallon bucket should fit about one 10 frame deep, uh, full, full of honey. Um, the bucket holds about 60 pounds. Frames, frames of, of, of honey hold, uh, you know, deeps hold anywhere from six to nine pounds of honey. So you can fit most of a deep in, in one of these buckets. Uh, again, if you have multiple supers, this is not really the process that you're looking for. Um, so I'm going to do this uh, explaining as if you only had a few frames. Like I said, you're going to scrape, put this back in the hive. The bees will be more than happy to spend the afternoon cleaning up all that honey that's loose. Um, already start drawing new comb on this and filling up that comb with the honey that you left behind. Um, so even though you destroy the wax that they spent a long time working on, they do still have the foundation to go back to. They can clean up the frame in their own uh, you know, home, their own hive, and have an easy time with it. So that's the primary part. You, cr you, you scrape the comb off into the bucket, put your lid back on, put the frame back in the hive, go to the next hive, pull another frame, scrape it, lid, put it back. Once you've scraped all of your frames into the bucket, you wanna put your lid on. Um, you could leave your scraper outside. Uh, the bees will be more than happy to clean up the leftover honey on the scraper. Uh, now we're done with the bees. You can close up your apiary, no problem. Leave them, leave them where they are. Put the lid on your bucket. Now, when you get back into the house, clean the outside of the bucket, clean your shoes, clean your, your hands, because once honey gets onto the doorknobs or the floor in your house, it goes everywhere. Uh, so it, <laughs> you don't want to mess around. You want to be very clean and diligent while you're doing this process because it can get out of hand very quick. Um, and not everyone has pets that can like lick up honey from the floor. Be careful about honey and beeswax on your shoes and on the bucket. Um, once the lid's on, you could, if you have a sink that has a sprayer, you could spray the bottom of the bucket, get it nice and clean, and of course, dry everything when you're done. So now, in this bucket, we have all of our loose honeycomb that was kind of shredded up in the scraping process. What you can do is take a, oh, <laughs> I chose a, a green scraper and it's getting lost in my green screen. <laughs> anyway, you can take a, a, a spatula or a wooden spoon or a different scraper and chop up the big chunks of comb that are floating in this honey. And then I would just let it sit for, for an hour or so. Um, here, what I have is a jar of crush and strain honey that I already started the process on, but if I spin the honey around, you can see there's all kinds of debris floating in here. There's chunks of beeswax, little wood chips, um, bee legs, all kinds of stuff floating in this honey. But you see that it's floating. The honey sinks, wood chips, dead bees, uh, honeycomb, all floats. So when you give your bucket some time to settle, um, there'll be a thick layer of honeycomb that is mixed with honey floating on top. What I would recommend is that you take uh, a ladle or a, another scraper and a tall jar. So if you have a, a jar like this or a quart jar, I would scrape that wax off, put it in the jar, and then allow it a second opportunity to settle. Um, you'll realize that out of a quart, there's probably uh, of, of wet cappings, there's probably a whole nother cup of honey hiding in there. Um, so that's one way to farther separate the wax. But once you have this bucket and you scrape off that primary layer of beeswax, you'll be left with 
what I have here in this jar, which is mostly clean honey with a very thin band of debris. And the strain part of crush and strain comes in now. Once you've eliminated that, that primary layer of comb, then you can use your strainer and your second bucket. If you're using a gate bucket like I have here, this is what you want your final product to end up in because you can bottle right from here. So take your gate bucket, add your strainer, and then pour your um, honey that you have this the first layer on. Oh, hi, Joy. Um, the first layer that you've pulled off, now you're left with your honey that most of the debris is separated out of. This will help your filter have an easier time. Just dump it right into your filter. And it might take some time for the honey to drip through. You might have to come in with another scraper and um, lightly remove some debris from the, the filter. Uh, this will allow the honey to drip through a bit easier. But once your honey has come through the filter and is in the gate bucket, you are ready to bottle. Um, Bottling is going to be a whole nother beak talk because, um, I mean, we can definitely spend the time for it. But you want to wash and dry your jars. Again, dry everything that you're using. Everything has to be food safe and cleaned because this is a food process. Um, but that is the basics of doing crush and strain. Uh, primary bucket, you scrape your frames in the field, bring the scrapings into the house, let them separate, pull off the cappings and the other debris, and uh, put that in a second jar to allow it to settle again. Filter uh, the honey that you got, and once it's filtered through, you can bottle it. You're, you're ready to go. So this is a really great way to extract, I'm going to say if you have uh, six six to 10 frames of honey that you want to pull from a hive or a couple of hives, this is a pretty, pretty good way to do it without having to invest in a lot of beekeeping equipment. Another thing to keep in mind, if you're a member of a local beekeeping group, there is probably other beekeepers who have extraction equipment uh, and wouldn't mind allowing you to borrow it as long as you clean it and return it well. Um, or you could extract with them in a series, so let them go first and then you can go after. Um, so look around, if you're part of a beekeeping community, there's probably some folks who are willing to help you. The other thing that I wanna talk about is your cappings. Remember I told you to, to scrape off that primary float of cappings and put it in a second jar? Once you've allowed that jar the opportunity to settle again, you'll have mostly dry cappings at the top that you can scrape off with a spoon. If you're looking to, um, excuse me, if you're looking to render your own beeswax or you know someone who is, you can keep those cappings just the way they are. Um, if you don't really mind about that uh, and you, know, you only have a couple of ounces of wax and you don't really wanna deal with it, what I'd recommend is you scrape off the cappings until you get to that bottom layer of honey, dump the honey into the filter, the same process we already talked about. But those cappings, even though they've settled again, they still have a lot of honey in them. So what you can do is lay those cappings out on a tin or a, a baking tray and put it outside on a sunny day. And basically what will happen is those bees will be drawn to eat up the miscellaneous honey that's left behind. Uh, so this is a great way during a dearth or a, a, a not honey flow to allow the bees a little bit of extra food. When you're doing this process, remember that a one teaspoon of honey is the life work of a dozen bees. Um, so you kind of want to be a little respectful with your honey waste. It's, you know, beekeeping is an expensive hobby and, you know, you are using the labor of the bees uh, to make that honey. So you do want to be respectful and, you know, definitely do a good job of scraping and trying your best to get every drop of honey that you can. But it does reach a point where you say, 
there's only a little bit of honey left in the bottom of this. I can't fill up another jar. You know, the spatula's sticky, the filter's sticky with honey. I don't wanna wash it. What you can do is put all of this equipment, this is what I do. Anytime I do, I bottle honey or I have a, a, a wet bucket or wet tools, I keep them in the bucket, put the lid on the bucket, just as if it was full of honey anyway, and then I wait until the springtime when the bees need a little boost or in the, the dead heat of the summer when there's not a lot of food around. And then I take the bucket outside, remove the lid, and the bees are more than happy to clean up any miscellaneous honey that's left behind. Um, like I said, one teaspoon is the life work of a dozen bees. But if some bees can go and collect that already produced honey and bring it back to the hive, that's, that's as if you had extra frames of brood and uh, a really efficient hive. So saving, saving your equipment to allow the bees to have the first clean on and then taking it into your kitchen, you know, come back at night when there's no bees around. And then you can come back and collect your equipment and wash it like regular. Um, that's definitely a good way to do it. The last tip that I want to offer is storing your equipment. Uh, I don't want to mix my painting stuff with my bee stuff, with my regular kitchen stuff. So when I wash my beekeeping equipment, so I'll wash this bucket and the filter and everything all at once. Once it's clean and dry, I'll put it in a fresh garbage bag and wrap it up. That way, the next time I'm doing honey, I can pull it out of the garbage bag, give it a quick wash and dry again, just to make sure it's clean, clean. Um, and that way I don't have to deal with, you know, the dust and debris that just builds up over time. Because for many people, you only extract once or twice a year. Um, so that's some of my advice about crush and strain. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to see them in the comments section. I can come through and answer those questions for you. I have a link on my website to a heavy duty metal strainer that is really good. I also have links to a gate bucket. Uh, it actually comes as a combo from Amazon. Uh, if you purchase anything through those affiliate links, I get a kickback, which is great for the show. Uh, you can also purchase any of these cool uh, bee stickers or any of my beekeeping merchandise. You can also check out my nukes if you are in the Poconos of Pennsylvania and want locally raised bees. I'm your guy for that. Um, so as long as, oh, I have Joe. Uh, Jody's saying, thank you, Eric. The talk was very informative. Thanks, Jody. I appreciate it. Um, definitely, I love sharing information about bees. Honey extraction is one of those things that beekeepers uh, learn earlier than they should. Um, I think if you want to become a beekeeper, you should learn about the bees first and then learn about extraction. But since everyone loves the sweet stuff, uh, a lot of folks want to learn how, how to get the honey first. And uh, I know some folks actually have a phobia of the, the holes on things. So a lot of folks don't like uh, honeycombs uh, because of the, the holes. I don't know. I think that's interesting. But it's funny. If you look on YouTube, you'll see a lot of, a lot of resources about honey extraction. And some of them are those like satisfying videos. Um, but some people don't like them because of the holes. I have to look up the name. If you know the name of what the fear of holes is, let me know. Because that's, that's what I'm talking about. But I just can't remember the name of it. Uh, let me check through my notes and make sure I, I touched up on everything. Oh, as far as your cappings go, if you do want to retain cappings to render yourself, uh, render is basically taking the crumbled up dirty beeswax and making it a usable bar uh, that can be broken up to make cosmetics and things like that. Um, I would recommend having a freezer bag ready when you have your cappings as dry as you would like them to be, or as long as you're willing to wait to let them dry. Uh, I would scrape those cappings into a, a big freezer bag, a heavy duty freezer bag, write the date that you extracted them, just so you can keep that in mind. 
Uh, if it's useful down the road, it's better to have the date than to not have it. And then I would just pop that freezer bag in the freezer. This will kill any wax moths that might have hitched a ride in the process. Um, if you just leave it out on your counter, you can come back a couple weeks later to a whole bag full of wax moths, which is really gross. Um, anyway, pop it in the freezer until you've done a, a few extractions and have enough to render or find someone in your bee club who can render the wax for you. Maybe you give them a couple of, pound, of pounds of cappings and they'll give you a pound of beeswax when it's all rendered. Um, that's a really easy way to get your beeswax rendered for you, uh, is to go in as a team in your, your local area. So one person does it and uh, everyone gets a little benefit from it. Uh, because again, that is, that is one of those processes. I'll do a whole big talk about it, but, uh, one of those processes that you definitely need special dedicated equipment for. Um, oh, Jim is looking for the link for Honeybee Democracy. It is a great book. It is on um, my website. So if you are in the comment section on this live stream, you can go to one of the first comments that I posted from my account and it has a link to my website, blossombuzzbees.buzz. When you're on my website, you can find um, a suggested product page. Those are all links to Amazon. Amazon is doing a great job of offering things a, he a heck of a lot cheaper than I could offer myself. Um, but if you purchase the book or any, any products through those links, I get a very small kickback, but it's better than nothing. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a great book to read if you are interested in the way that bees make decisions. Uh, they're actually very coordinated and organized and, and rather fair with the way they make their decisions. Um, I told you in a previous Beak Talk that one bee doesn't make a difference. Uh, you need the whole colony to count. However, I don't want to uh, forget the decisions that need to be made intercolony. So within the colony, they have a lot to discuss, and each bee does matter to the colony, but just to the beekeeper, we're only counting the colony, not the individual bees. So there's a lot to learn from this book. Uh, it's a really great book. I read it a few years ago. I have to go through and read it again because I'm sure I can pick up a lot more information than I did back then. But the link to this book is on my suggested products page on blossombuzzbees.buzz. If I have no other comments for today's show, I'm going to end the show. And thank you for watching.